Hello, I'm Dr. Nick Van Ter Hayden. Welcome to this webinar. Essential conversations on COVID-19 treatment at home and hospital with an FDA emergency use authorization or EUA. Our panelists will be answering questions at the end of this conversation. So please submit them through the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of this screen. Let me introduce our two guests today, the Honorable Dr. David Shulkin. He is the ninth secretary of the US Department of Veterans Affairs, nominated by President Trump to serve in his cabinet. Secretary Shulkin was confirmed by the US Senate on February the 14th, 2017, by a vote of 100 to zero. And Dr. Peter Stutz is the co-founder and chief medical officer of ElectroCorps and an internationally recognized expert in neuromodulation strategies and minimally invasive procedures for chronic pain. Thank you, everybody. Glad you could join us today. I think we're here at one of the most challenging times in medicine that most of us have ever experienced. Uh, there have been other pandemics, but none anything like this one that I know anybody who's lived through. Uh, so today we're going to have a very focused conversation about a new approach to the management of patients with COVID-19. It's just going to be 20 minutes long, which is approximately about my attention span. And so as Nick had said, we call this essential conversation. So let's get right at it. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today we're going to have with Dr. Peter Statz. Dr. Statz is working in an area that I don't think a lot of people know about, but I think it holds a lot of promise. And so I really want to have a conversation about it today. Uh, my interest was really piqued when I heard that this is something that's helping veterans, which is something that I'm very passionate about. And anything that helps veterans and can help us out of this pandemic, um, I'm all for. So we're going to be talking today about a very important part of the body. It's what I call the Rodney Dangerfield part of the body because it doesn't get as much respect as it deserves. I'm talking about the vagus nerve. But Peter is an expert in this nerve and how it relates to COVID-19 is something we're going to be talking about. But first, you know, before we hear about the science behind this, I always like to learn something about the person behind it. And I often find that people who are doing interesting things have been influenced by things that have happened to them personally or something unusual that took them down an unusual path. Uh, so Peter, welcome. And so did anything like this, did, was there anything personal that took you down this path to study the vagus nerve? Yeah, well, first of all, Secretary Shulkin, thank you very much for putting some attention on this for our veterans and for American citizens and for the citizens of the world. I appreciate you putting part of your brain power into helping solve this problem. I was interested in this, and I'm a longtime neuromodulation person. I was an anesthesiologist, critical care physician, ran the program at Johns Hopkins for the pain division, and had been thinking long and hard about neuromodulation when I learned that my son had peanut allergies. Now, historically, we've known that with things like spinal cord stimulation, we can affect the blood flow to the heart and to the legs and improve pain. And I really stopped to think about what happens with anaphylaxis to peanuts and what happens to the airways. And was there something that we could potentially do beyond taking him to the emergency room with epinephrine shots to try to save his life? And so I thought I'd marry my interest from being a clinician to trying to solve an under uh, explored problem and seeing if there was a way to try to help with that. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, so you're that you're the head of pain service for Johns Hopkins University. You're one of the youngest division chiefs ever at Hopkins. Uh, you're an anesthesiologist. How how do you get into this neuromodulation thing? I mean, why why would you why would you throw away a good career to look at neuromodulation? Just well, uh, well I, I, it's an interesting time frame in my life. I was uh, early on was an anesthesiologist. Uh, the department chair um, offered me the chance to start a division of pain medicine. And I think I probably was, if not the youngest, one of the youngest division chiefs ever at that institution. And I realized that the future was going to be in the use of electricity and site-specific drugs, a field of neuromodulation. And I became very passionate about that early on in my career. Um, 
And over time, we've taken things from being complex spinal surgery to where I think we are today is we've taken the surgery out of the surgeon's hand and we've developed a device that is really in the patient's hands. But it's been my entire academic career has been around this whole area. Yeah. Now, certainly as an as anesthesiologist, as a pain medicine specialist, you've been involved in really what's, you know, this bioelectric medicine, which is using stimulation to stimulate nerves. Can, can tell us a little bit about where that stands in terms of the contemporary thinking in medicine and, you know, what's the history of using elect, electric medicine to be able to help people with pain and other conditions? Well, it depends on how far back we want to go. Uh, there was something called the Baghdad battery from outside of uh, uh, Iraq uh, that was buried with the kings of Iraq 2,500 years ago. Um, Scribonius Largus uh, is credited with putting a live black torpedo, an aquatic animal capable of electric discharge, on the heads of people with arthritis and other headaches. But more recently, we have to fast forward to 1950s when Earl Bakken stimulated the heart to uh, develop a device that could um, keep the heart uh, pumping and heart beating, uh, and it was a wearable externalized device. And over the last 70 years, we've really used electricity really broadly in advancing medicine. You know, you would think about yeah. Earl Bakken and pacemakers, spinal cord stimulators are the state of the art. We recently published a paper on spinal cord stimulation. Again, not the focus of this talk today, but spinal cord stimulation in, in Lancet with really um, phenomenal results. We've got use electrical stimulation to treat things like uh, incontinence and, and other areas. So electricity is really part and parcel of how we care for patients today. But it's kind of remarkable that people don't really think of it that way and don't recognize the power of electricity that we may be able to use and harness to help patients with this disease. No, I think that history is really interesting. And of course, we're going to get very, very soon to how this possibly could relate to COVID-19. But just to finish out the story, so, so you're this academic, you're helping people, you get into this area, you discover there's some promise. So how do you get involved with a company that actually wants to build a device like this? Well, interesting that I had been sitting thinking about this. I was president of the Neuromodulation Society, and I met up with a brilliant guy, J.P. Erico, who was having similar thoughts uh, about vagus nerve and how you could control various aspects um, of disease. And we met up on a train one day, uh, coming back from the NANS meeting and started throwing things back and forth. And uh, we and several others started this company called ElectroCore. 2004, 2005, to try to come up with ways of improving airway reactivity using electrical stimulation. So and of course, th that's, where, that's where I met you guys. I was the CEO of a large hospital in Northern New Jersey, and you guys came to my office and you said, we've got this crazy idea. And I said, you know what, maybe it's not so crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and it's been great. You've, that was uh, 15 years ago. You guys have done a great job. So, so, so tell us what this device looks like today, you know, what all this creative ideas actually led to. Well, it started with animal models. We went to Columbia University and worked with some of my former colleagues from Hopkins and were able to demonstrate that by we could identify a frequency that if we stimulate the vagus nerve, we could open up the airways or bron decrease bronchoconstriction in an animal model. We then took this to cadavers and figured out a way of percutaneously placing an electrode or just through the skin, put in an electrode. And then Bruce Simon, one of our, our top guys, figured out a way of developing a, excuse me, a non-invasive approach. So what I had spent my whole life doing is trying to figure out how to put electrodes in funny places he, in a matter of moments, said, well, we don't really need to do that. We can take a device like this, place it on the neck with a little bit of conducting gel, and we can stimulate the vagus nerve effectively and efficiently. And that was kind of a game changer, I think, for us, because we realized this somewhat was segueing out of the idea of a surgical approach to taking neuromodulation, and we could potentially move this up in the algorithm of treatment for patients because there was no surgery required. 
Hold, hold that up again so people can see it. It looks like my electric razor. That's you know, right. yeah, right. So, um, so, so tell us, tell us. Smaller than my cell phone. Oh, it's smaller. Okay, that's good. Um, so before COVID came around, what, what was the primary indication? What are the primary indications for, for this type of device? So early on when we were doing our studies on airway reactivity, we realized that patients' headaches were going away. And we did a lot of animal work. We co collaborated with the folks up at Harvard and some you know, future NIH scientists and people around the world to really figure out how this was working. We then did a large a number of large scale clinical trials throughout the world, uh, demonstrating that this can be effective in, in broadly speaking cluster patients and migraine patients. We now have four indications, the acute treatment of episodic cluster, the adjunctive use for preventive cluster, to preventing cluster. Which are headaches. Which are which called suicide headaches. Right. The worst kind of headache known to man um, that I can think of. Um, uh, acute treatment of migraines. 36 million Americans suffer from migraines out there. Mm -hmm. And then prevention of migraines. It's the only device that I'm aware of that yeah. has all four of those broad indications for acute and treatment for so, different types of primary headaches. So, so you have these indications for cluster headaches and migraines, and now 2020 comes along and we have COVID. What's the relationship? I mean, what, what, why, are, why are we even talking about what you're doing with COVID? How, how could this possibly be involved? So there's another piece of the puzzle here that I haven't told you yet. We have been doing some work, but we're not alone in this. There's worldwide experts have been studying this and a brilliant guy unaffiliated with us at all had been studying what's something called the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. That's a fancy set of words to say the vagus nerve can control the stimulation uh, by stimulating the vagus nerve. One can control inflammation that comes from the gut. And that's what's been termed cytokines in the cytokine storm. And he had published about this and it's done a tremendous amount of work. So back in 2000, early 2000, we were all very concerned about um, running out of ventilators. And I knew that we had some work with airway reactivity. I was concerned about these cytokine storms and um, and I knew, so we had airway reactivity, we had cytokines, and we had some patients who had tried it um, and had improvement in their ability to breathe. We wrote this all up, and that's all published in a, a journal called Neuromodulation. They accepted it very rapidly, um, uh, went through the entire peer review process as it's supposed to do, and discussed the mechanisms, the medical hypothesis, and the early clinical experience. Uh, We've submitted that to the FDA, and really in record time, they issued what is called the emergency use authorization, and it is for patients with known or suspected, so really quite broad there, known or suspected, to be delivered by the patient or a healthcare provider uh, uh, in the home setting or in a hospital setting for patients with asthma an exacerbation of their airway reactivity due to COVID. So it is a very broad, but narrow, because it covers a swath of the population, but it was indicated for the patients with airway reactivity, the asthma patients. Um, and um, they, they authorized this uh, back in July, so. Back in, back in July? July okay. of this year. So we submitted yeah. in April, uh, in, May, in March, uh, the, um, Secretary of Health and Human Services, I know you know him quite well, uh, he uh, issued that uh, uh, something part of the 564 document that mm -hmm. medical devices should mm -hmm. be used during this crisis. Right. And uh, um, we followed that pathway down to get so, this. So let me just go through this just, just for a second. A person who's got asthma or reactive airway disease, when you get an infection like COVID, may cause bronchoconstriction, more difficulty breathing, shortness of breath. And this is a device that if you stimulate the vagus nerve may help open up the airway and help people with symptomatic breathing. That's right. You can't, you breathe, said, 
you can't breathe, you, you won't get better. So you have to help right. you breathe. And so that was really a big part of our initial foray into this whole area. And you said this can be done even at home. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as I look at it for your veterans who have such a wonderful telehealth service, when they're seeing their pulmonologist, they're seeing their primary care doctor via telehealth, the doctor can say, well, look, you lost your sense of smell. Um, you were um, associated with someone who's got COVID. Here's a therapy that you can do today, and they can drop ship it right to the patient's home with presumed COVID. Or, of course, if somebody gets a test and they're positive, that would be another reason to use it. I'm glad, Peter, that you brought this back to veterans because I am very concerned about what's happening. Many of our veterans are older and are homebound. Um, and so tell me, how, how do veterans get access to something like this? You know, we've, we've been hearing on TV about some pretty interesting new therapies, but most Americans don't have access to it. So if you're a veteran, can you get this or is this just uh, – yeah something that is more interesting for them to learn about? Oh, no, no, this is available today. And that was actually part of the questions that we got early on is, how, do you have enough uh, stockpile to be able to help Americans if we uh, authorize this? And the answer was, yes, we do. Uh, if uh, the doctor feels this is in the best interest of their patients, they can write a prescription. Uh, and it's not just veterans affairs, it's um, you know other patients as well. Uh, get a prescription, this can be uh, shipped directly to the patient's home. I see, okay. And so so how come people don't know about this? I mean, I've never, you know, every, every time you turn on the TV, all we're hearing about is COVID and we're hearing about new medications and vaccines. And yet I never meet anybody who knows about this as potentially something that could be helpful to a subset of patients. So, um, is well, that your experience or are people learning about this? Yeah, no, look, if you were to speak with the pain doctors, they all know about neuromodulation. When you start to get into a different realm of the pulmonologist, it, they have to jump this gap to say, oh, okay, you have a vagus nerve that can open up the lungs, and I didn't actually even know about that. And they have to think through all of these different, uh, I don't know, aspects of the disease that in a crisis, it's hard for them to do. So I think that's part of it. Um, and I also think there's a little bit of a bias against the medical device. How could a little device like this open up the airways so much? The facts are the facts. I mean, they do. And we've got great data that shows this in non-COVID patients, and we're starting to collect more data now as we go. Uh, so why don't people know about it? Uh, I don't know. I, it's clearly there in the FDA. Um, go to the FDA website, look up medical devices, and you'll find that this is, I believe, the only therapeutic that's authorized. But you have to scroll down about six pages because everything else is a ventilator or you know some other aspect that uh, is not so ther much therapeutic, uh, or maybe it's a PPE, or maybe it's uh, diagnostic. Very, very few therapeutics are out there. Uh, remdesivir, uh, plasma convalescent serum, this, uh, there was chloroquines and that was withdrawn. So, you know, we're in a very elite group and it's really something that everybody should know about. Right. Well, unfortunately, we don't see there being any letting up of this virus being around. And so the more the people learn about COVID, how to protect themselves, how to manage their condition, should they or a loved one get the virus, I think the better it is. That's why we call this an essential conversation and our 20 minutes are up yeah. and uh, we did what I hope to do which is to make people understand about a new and exciting area and something that might help somebody someday and particularly our veterans. So thank you very much Dr. Stats. I appreciate it. If you have some time we're going to um, just share uh, a little bit of, inf of information about the device for a second and then we're going to see if there are any questions that have been submitted from people who have been listening today. And if you uh, don't mind sticking around to see if there are any questions. I'd be honored, thank you. And it's, I should just say, it's been a tremendous honor to work with you on this because uh, the fact that you're putting your brain power and energy behind this um, is a real testament to the therapy and your focus on helping citizens in the United States uh, and in particular veterans, thank you. 
Well, you know, as I said in the beginning, um, none of us have lived through this pandemic and watching uh, so many people's lives be destroyed. I think we all are looking for important therapies that work and ways that we can get through this pandemic this pandemic. Thanks to everybody. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today. Um, that's the end of the webinar.